welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. My column will be read to you shortly. It was not only a Satoria stamp, but the charisma of his macho presence. He made a political regalia of his acquitted top and trousers, red cap, and his glowing dark skin. And you could not miss the voice, the boom of the Anambra Orchestra. No leader, perhaps in Stafawa Balewa, will lead with the rare future of his vocal gift. No broadcaster, but he would dwarf any electronic larynx evangelizing his own programs. Chukuma Soludo at last mounted the throne as governor of Anambra State. He does so with a mighty credentia, hardly matched by any in any office. The former CBN chief now becomes a chief servant of one of Nigeria's top entrepreneurial states. His speech was a promise, but a restraint, an embrace, but a caution, a flight, but a crawl, a dream inside a pragmatic vision, soars but santas, at once revolutionary and conservative. Unmistakable is his avowal of an ideology called Pan-African Market Progressivism. It brings the market impulse for popular good, goods for the good of all. It reflects a man with a mission and aware of the watch eye of posterity. He spoke with zest and detail. He wants to transform many things, for commercial brio, to praise and challenge Inewe and Onicha duopoly, and steer the people to trust and taxes, for politics to create a cooperative society by deeming the tides of violence and enlisting the renegade forces of IPOP, criminality, and ESN to a band of brothers. Kauta will brandish standards and locally made goods in a high-tech context to bring Anambra to the world and the world to Anambra. To bring plenty through a frugal style, all under the umbrella of an ideology at once indigenous and universal. It was delivered in a tone at once sober and optimistic, but put enough celebration until the job is done. For optics, no one could forget the reference to Innocent as his official car and all maids and clothes and shoes within Anambra confines. He has presented the agenda. After the people, Anambra bigwigs led by the inimitable Obieze Kwesele anointed him. He has whetted the appetite. His gunpowder is dry. The eagle is looking at the sky. He has fluttered his wings. Now in flight, look out. Welcome to Big Talk. I have a very special guest for you today. It's none other than the preeminent poet, essays, writer, scholar, and public um, commentator. Uh, he is Professor Nini Oshundari. Welcome to this show, sir. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure meeting you again. <laughs> Great pleasure. Um, before I start, I want to ask you, um, how has COVID been for you in terms of creative writing? I think it has cut both ways. COVID has given us uh, a certain kind of, well, I would say new ways of looking at life, new unexpected ways of looking at life. Uh, for the most part of a whole year, humanity was forced to be indoors. Movement was curtailed. And I think one of the most important aspects of the freedoms we enjoy is the freedom of movement. What COVID did was to take that away from us. That itself is an existential development, the type that lends uh, itself to a lot of poetizing. So like other human beings, I too was forced to stay at home. So for the first time, 
I couldn't go out and it was there with family. So I had to sit down and, uh, and write. Uh, and I think some of uh, the COVID poems were published uh, in my Sunday poetry column in The Nation. Uh, it is an ongoing thing, you know, um, because human beings' attitudes to COVID were also really curious, you know, um, from a kind of cowardly acceptance to some kind of superstitious and individualistic denial of the existence of this virus that is killing so many human beings. Uh, plagues and pestilences have always given rise to literature. I mean, we remember the works of uh, Daniel Defoe, Year of the Plague Year. Uh, so many things that were written on the bubonic plague in Europe and the series of uh, works on the influenza of seven, 1917 to 1918. Uh, that was a period in human history that was actually fraught because we were dealing with the First World War and then there was another war that was, war, uh, that was waged by an invis invisible uh, virus. You know. So it, there is a lot about COVID, a lot about the virus that uh, lends itself to um, uh, the imagination of the poet, the imagination of any imaginative person, and the ironies that surround the existence of uh, the, th the existence and the impact of the, the bug itself. Thank you very much. Now you come out with two very interesting volumes of poetry. One is Snap Songs, uh, Home Clones and uh, Fallen Flares, Volume 1. And then you have Green, Size of Our Alien Planet. The Snap Songs are followed very closely every, um, every Sunday <laughs> at uh, the Nation newspaper. Um, mm -hmm. Professor, I want to ask, how is it uh, uh, possible to sustain such a column? Because, you know, to write prose every week mm. is itself mm. a burden. Mm. But mm. poetry, which is supposed to be the elite of all writing, is supposed to take a lot more energy, a lot more concentration. Mm. And to do it consistently, were you even awed by the task you gave yourself? Mm. It's ironic that one of my favorite columnists <laughs> is asking him, asking me about the pains of uh, writing every week. I must tell you that it is mutual. When I see what you guys do Monday, Tuesday, and so on, I also wonder how come it, how are you able to make it happen every week? Um, so what I'm going to say will be very familiar to you. When it first began, it looked like an impossibility. Then when I went into it, it was difficult to begin with, but somehow my consciousness, my brain, my heart, and my whole existence adjusted to it. So much so that when one poem is out on Sunday, by about Monday, Tuesday, I'm beginning to think about the next one. It is not the best way to live, <laughs> I must <laughs> tell you, because uh, yes, it consumes so much of your consciousness and it makes you irritable, which is why uh, creative people are often irritable, because we live in these two worlds. Uh, the external world, that's the one you share with family, with friends, and so on. But there is the subterranean world. Uh, that's the world of the, the imagination, yes. And there are times you operate uh, at the two levels at the same time, but most of the time, one has to be subject, uh, subject in fact, subjugated for the other to take place. But one thing, one of uh, the factors that have kept me going, really. I would say stubborn will, that's number one. Two, um, the vow I 
made many, many, many years ago uh, about um, my commitment to non-silence. Uh, then number three, our world itself, which is full of ideas, which is full of turmoil, a little peace here and there, a little pleasure, but a lot of pain, particularly that spot of the world we call Nigeria. Always something uh, to, uh, to write about. Finally, finally, I have to thank, which is ironical again, military dictatorship in Nigeria, because my Sunday poetry column, and I look at the history uh, of Nigeria. I don't know whether this has happened anywhere uh, before. Uh, yeah, columns in prose, yes, but columns in poetry, extremely um, rare. This, uh, this began during the uh, military, uh, mil military dictatorship in Nigeria. Although I had some kind of pre rehearsal in 1983, when um, Fadeko uh, mismanaged the election. And, uh, you know, so I did a call, I, not a column, a series of poems that were published. And I must tell you that the kind of reactions I got to those poems really opened my eyes. Oh, so this is what, this is the power of the mass media. Um, so in 1985, yeah, when we were in, under full-blown dictatorship. That was when I really began. With the passing of Decree 2 and then Decree 4, oh my God, when it became an offense, if I a crime, to publish the truth, that I began to wonder, what are we going to, to do? Um, it gave me a lot of uh, tough time, but then I took to poetry. Uh, satires and uh, and so on. As I said during the uh, book presentation on February 20, poetry saved my life in a way, saved my sanity because it gave me an outlet. Songs of the season that was first of all in the Tribune, and then later on moved to uh, uh, to the nation. Our country. Uh, provides us a lot of material to write about. That country that pro provides so much material for us to write about, but that also disables us because it doesn't provide us with the uh, wherewithal to do the job. So it's a struggle. It has been a struggle for the past 40 years. Snap songs. I, I wonder, because while we did it sometimes, I wonder whether you see yourself as competing with historians as a chronicler of the past from mm. a perspective? Oh, no competition. Uh, I, I see this as uh, a kind of mutual engagement, um, mutual sensibility, as it were. Um, you are very much in the trade yourself. We all know that um, all writers in the world that have mattered have also been historians. Uh, not professional historians, not willing voluntary historians, but at times historians by default, uh, historians by just the accident, professional accident of what they are doing. We're dealing with ideas. Uh, we're dealing with the movement of ideas. We're dealing with uh, happiness. How do happiness and occurrences become history? Uh, what is the relationship between the two and memory and the human faculty of remembrance? Yes, something happens in the instant. That's when we look at it, oh, this is it, it is bleeding, it's raw, it's fresh. And you talk about it in the past tense. Another few hours later, you begin to talk about it in the past tense. By the time you have reverted to the past tense, you have already historicized that event. This is really how history is made. And I think this is how 
the movement of ideas also works um, in literature. The historian and the writer, whether you it's an essayist or poet or columnist or dramatist um, or, or novelist, we all fish in the same pond. I mean, uh, the, the poet joining uh, uh, the, 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 this, uh, uh, this group. Um, because it is ideas we're talk, uh, we all deal with. The occurrence of all those ideas and then their, uh, their impact. I don't know whether it is possible to talk about Shakespeare without first of all talking about Elizabethan England. Uh, John Milton without talking about Jacobean England. Walt Whitman without talking about the history of America in the 18th century. Fagunwa without talking about what Yoruba land, what Nigeria were at the time he was writing, or Wale or JP, uh, uh, JP Clark, and uh, so on and so forth. So um, the writer, the literary writer is a historian of a kind. And I dare say that the historian is also a literary artist because it is not just the concatenation of events. It is not just the, um, the segmenting of those events or the writing of them or about them. These are not just, these are not the only things that matter in history. We also have to look at the art of the rendering, the beauty of the rendering. What is it that makes Herodotus memorable to us even today, memorable Herodotus of the classical period? What is yeah. it in the works of, in the writing of J.F. Adeyajayi, of Afibo, of Anene, of uh, Boahe, uh, and of the um, uh, the the uh, thing, you know, uh, these are historians, quite right. But they are historians whose works I enjoy when I read them because I read them for the facts they produce. I also read them for the imagination that must have been behind the writing. Words are the meeting point between the historian and. Uh, and the literary artist. History and the narration of it cannot happen without words. And when we talk about um, literature, we're also talking about, uh, uh, about words. So, so this is it. Um, but chronicler, mm, I think there is some fine distinction between the chronicler and the historian. The chronicler is more interested in gathering, uh, gathering ideas uh, and so on and writing about them with or without mm, much of an artistic consciousness. Chronicles, oh, this and this. You, 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 you put the ideas together the way they come. The historian on the other hand is much more conscious of the happenings, is much more conscious about the recording of the, uh, uh, of the events. So um, I, yes, but as I said, it's a very, very fine distinction I'm making. The chronicler and the historian do meet, no doubt. Uh, when I sit down to write these songs, I know that I'm writing something that will be read today and I hope will be relevant. But I also have my eyes on the future because you, you expect your work to live. And for something to live, it has to pass through the paradigms and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the matrices of, uh, of time. So there is what we call recording the ideas as they happen. And there is also a way of allowing those ideas to play around in your mind for some time before you then settle down and distill art from them. This is precisely what I try to do with the um, snap songs, uh, which are called Lifelines. Began, it began many, many years ago as songs of the season. 
what could be more, uh, more relevant to history than the word season. So it's a time conscious kind of uh, uh, activity one is uh, uh, engaging in. And finally, this is, really shows us that time is not segmentable the way we human beings think it is. No, events work into one another, occurrences work into one another, human foibles, flaws, work into one another, human strength and uh, courage also work into one another. As it was in the beginning, it still very much is, and it's likely it will be like that for a long, long time to come. So the unbroken chain of humanity, the unbroken chain of uh, existence, both contribute to the unbroken chain of history. So the next question, sir, thinking about time and uh, errors, there is also a certain tension in your poetry between past and present in the, in the use of images and so on. You see something that, for instance, I saw one of the poems that reminds me of, um, of um, Water, Water Everywhere. That's uh, one nation underwater, flood, flood, flood everywhere in choices parts of town. Reminds me of Coleridge. And then you have others, some of them written in Yoruba, then mm. you have this one, our dirty notes, mm. where we are talking about 1,000 bills, 100 bills. Maybe in the future, we may not, they may look like, um, you know, uh, unimportant because private bills have changed. Maybe we, we may not even use bills anymore mm. and things like that. Mm. How do you respond to the tension of trying to immortalize a line and mm. also the, the tension? of not alienating the present. The tension, that tension is reinforced by the movement of history itself and also the unpredictability of, uh, um, of human existence. It is constantly, in my mind, aware as uh, uh, a scholar and as a teacher, and as a writer, that ideas also have a way of dating. You say something has dated. That is to say, its time is gone. Yeah, we do think about that. And that is where we call history to our aid. I remember 1965, my school, Amari Grammar School in Ikeregiji, we had a Sierra Leonean teacher, Mr. J.S. Mali. Manly, a man whose name I will never forget. He was the one who taught us Latin, English, and Shakespeare. In the first few pages of As You Like It, there was a phrase, something, something, I will physic your rankness. And the man wrote it on the chalkboard, was wondering, my voice, I will physic your rankness. What could this mean? And we kept on, for about 10 minutes, we kept on battling with it. And he then said, what's the meaning of the word physic? Is it physics, science? He said, no, no, no. The original meaning of the word physic. No. Then he said, have you ever heard physician? We said, yes. He said, yeah. That word was used by Shakespeare uh, at its time. It was a verb. Physic means to kill. Oh, well. Then rankness, rankness at that time meant rudeness. The point I'm making is words themselves change across the plane of time. This is why we are a deeper knowledge of literature, a deeper knowledge of art can only come to us if we go through the doors of history. You have to know, oh yeah, words have a way of changing their meanings. Look at the number of words that have come to uh, our communication, our different languages, particularly the English language, since the invention of the computer. You know, there is an anachronistic poem I'm doing, deliberate anachronism, where Shakespeare wrote, and somebody asked him, he said, oh yeah, oh, Shakespeare put his telephone away 
and went to download a few things in the room. Ah, uh, you just laughed. Download Shakespeare? No, no, no. Now download, um, what are we going to, so, so, so many things you download, you do this. So many words have come to us as a result of the invention of the computer. So yes, ideas do date, quite right, but human experiences do not. This is where scholarship, as I said, really comes in. There are certain words whose meanings you understand, certain expressions, you understand them straight away. But there are others whose meanings you have to trace. I studied the history of the English language, both at the University of Ibadan and the University of Leeds, I remember. Yes, it, it was so eye-opening. Old English, uh, early modern English, modern English, uh, and so on and so forth. And the way words have changed, not only their meanings, but also their pronunciation. We continue with the poem series, um, The Politician, and it will be read to you now. I may not be good with the wit, or indeed of hospitality. I may not be a good first in anything if a first lady. But now, in this public, I will make a bad scene, so people can remember me. So give me a slap in the cheek, so loud and cheeky, by that I may win immortality. Thank you for being on this show. You can join me on my column at www.samomashe.com and on my Twitter column at uh, Sam Omashe. And until next time, be good.